Monday, February 18th, 2013, the day that literally changed my life. My grandma had rang the doorbell and I had gotten up to answer it. Before I made it to my door, I got dizzy, fell, and blacked out. I woke up on the ground, more confused and scared than I'd ever been in my life. My face was hurting pretty bad. Most people, whenever they, uh, they meet me, they don't really suspect anything wrong with me maybe I could be a little ADD or uh, you know I might have any other normal issues that go with today's society but no one really suspects that uh, without a certain device I would not really be alive and that device is my pacemaker which is right there so you can see it feel it um, this pacemaker it's kind of a part of me now. It's kind of the reason why I'm a living. Uh, without it, I would actually be dying within a few years of now. So, this is the story of my pacemaker. I would say whenever I hit puberty. When I was going through puberty, I was, uh, I noticed that I was getting tired a lot. Like, I was always tired. More than, more than the normal amount. Because, like, when I was, a, I was a kid, I could stay awake till 2 a.m., on a weekday and go back to or go to school uh, at 7.30 in the morning. No big deal. Uh, I'd be a little grumpy the next day, but yeah. But uh, whenever I hit puberty, I started really needing those naps. And uh, there were a few things that uh, led up to... There was, a, there was a lot of things that led up to um, us finding out I needed a pacemaker. Uh, one of those things being, there was a couple years where I had back-to-back, -back, like, really bad health problems. One, yeah, one year I had kidney stones, the next year I got mono, and then um, that same year, um, my grandpa had passed away, and that was really tough on me. Uh, he was, like, one of my best friends. But... <clears throat> All of those things combined really helped bring out the pacemaker. Like I mentioned before, I was always really tired. And uh, especially when I hit high school, after mono, mono makes you tired all the time. But it like magnified it. Um, I had a very small case of mono, I wasn't in much pain. I, was, I basically had a bad sore throat, but it was the tiredness that really got to me. So I had to you know, stay home from school a couple times because I was just too tired to do anything. And then once I was cleared of mono, I got over it. I still never really got back to the previous self where I could still kind of stay up, but not, you know, be super tired. Um, my parents always gave me a hard time, especially my dad. Uh, because I was sleeping too much, and I, I couldn't help it. I just wanted to sleep. I, but I never. I always felt like I couldn't get enough sleep. There were times where I would be sleeping 14 hours a day. Um, that'd be the most. That'd be the most I've ever slept before, and I think I was like 16. There was 16 hours a day, one day. Oh. I. Uh, it was tough. It was really tough. Um, and so, one day, President's Day, um, February, uh, it was in February, President's Day, um, 2013, 2012, either 2012 or 2013, I, uh, my grandma had uh, come over, she rang the doorbell and I'd gotten up to answer it, it was like 12 in the, or it was 12 in the afternoon, and, uh, I'd gotten up. And I, as I got up, I got a little dizzy like I normally do after getting up, like out of laying in bed. And then all of a sudden, everything was black and I felt my face stinging. And 
I, uh, I didn't really know what was happening. Uh, I knew my eyes were open, but I couldn't see. And uh, it's probably one of the scariest moments of my life because I didn't, I just didn't know what, hap what was happening. And then my vision started coming to and I realized I was on the ground and uh, I'd lost control of my body. I, yeah, it clicked almost immediately. My legs were positioned that my feet were still on the ground pushing as if they were trying to stand up. Like my legs were trying to stand up on, uh, they didn't know that I'd fallen, kind of. So they're trying to stand up and this was causing me to push my face against the ground. Which then whenever I got up, I realized my face was really stinging and I touched it and you know, it felt like a scrape. So um, I was probably down for 20 seconds or something. It wasn't that long, um, but it was enough to freak me out. And I got out of, I went out of my room and went to the bathroom and my mom, my mom looked at me down the hall and was like, what did you do? And I told her I, I, I think I blacked out. And um, I went to the bathroom, got a washcloth, and was starting to clean the uh, scrape. And she asked me a few questions, and I was like, I was just trying to get up and answer the door, say hi to Nona. That's what I call my grandma. And I, uh, <sighs> the next few days kind of went by in a like in a blur and a flash at the same time. I remember um, later that night, my mom had take, gotten me like out of bed or something because I'd gone back for another nap and she was like, hey, you need uh, we need to go to the ER. And I was like, okay, why? And she was like, that, you should not be blacking out. And so we took, we went to the ER. Everything, they, they said that my heart wasn't beating correctly there was like abnormalities in my heart and um, I was like all right well great another thing like back-to-back -back years this would there's something now happening this year like I gotten over mono um, so they hooked me up with my uh, my cardiologist dr. Shaw and they told uh, we got an appointment with him and he told us what from what I remember there was one of two things he said the one that was most likely the most likely the cause was the um, I was just growing too fast for my uh, for my heart to keep up, which he said I would grow out of. Um, he actually mentioned that he would have bet money on it. He wanted to reassure us that it was that was probably what was happening. I just my heart couldn't keep up with how fast I was growing, which I was growing pretty fast, so it seemed very you know likely. And then he said, there is a second thing it could be, very rare, um, and I don't think this is what's the case, but just in case we need to put a monitor on you. He said, um, you may have this thing called AV node dysfunction, meaning part of my heart didn't, doesn't, uh, didn't develop all the way. And he said, he would go into that later, uh, he'd go into detail about all that stuff later if it turned out to be true. But he said, um, it's most likely I was just growing, um, but they're going to put a heart monitor on for, on me for like a month or something. Yeah, it was like a month. I, I forgot how long they told us, but it, it seemed like a long ass time for me because it was uncomfortable as hell. Um, so they had I had to have this thing. Um, I don't remember if it was, it was like kind of strapped to me and it, it was basically a heart monitor and I had like six nodes hooked up to my body at any given time. It was like six to 12, I forgot how many, but it was a ridiculous amount. And I had to put those on, um, I keep them on. I had, to, I had to have it hooked up to me like 24 seven. The only time I was allowed to take it off was whenever I was showering, which I couldn't shower often because it was a pain in the ass to shower. So I showered every other day or something like that. And I hated that, but yeah. And then just to add a salt to the wound, I turned out to be allergic to the little pads that were sticking to my body. So I ended up getting like blisters and stuff. It was painful as hell, but we got some like non-adhesive or some, some other pads, little sticky things, got those and um, 
about like two weeks or something went by. It was like a third of the time that they said I needed to be monitored. Um, I was walking home from school and my mom called me and was like, hey, where are you? And I was like, um, just about, I just got out of school. And she said, Dr. Shaw called back. We need to go back up there. He didn't give me any news, but we need to have another meeting with him. And I was like, well, shit. A few days later, he uh, we uh, went back to Dr. Shaw and talked to him again. And he told us that I did, in fact, have AV node dysfunction. And uh, basically, to make it um, to make it me understand it, he told uh, he told me that in the old days, you know, boats had drummers to keep everybody in rhythm, and the drummer of my heart hadn't developed all the way, so that was causing me to um, that was causing really weird heart rate problems. And he was like, the reason why you're tired all the time is because whenever you go to sleep your heart rate gets down to the low 20s, which is not good at all. And uh, that was scary. I was like, wow, I basically come close to dying every night. That was what I thought. Um, I remember for the longest time, I could actually feel my heart skipping beats, Um, especially whenever I was laying down, relaxing, about to go to bed, I could like hear my heartbeat going. And I thought if I concentrated hard enough, I could cause my heart to skip a beat, which in theory was really cool. I was like, man, I could fake my own death if I ever needed to. Just, you know, lay like lay there and just my heart like not or keep my heart from beating, and people would be like, oh, well, he's dead, and then I could be like, oh, run away or some shit. But uh, whenever I found out that it was actually not me causing the heart beats to stop. Um, You know, and I realized it was like a life or death kind of like situation. I was like, well, how long do I have to live? And he said, well, you need a pacemaker. That'll help you. Or once we get the pacemaker, you'll be fine. Um, But if you didn't get a pacemaker, you'd probably be dead around the age of 25, which I'm now 21. So I've had this for, I've had the pacemaker for five years. But, um, so I was thinking, and I was, I was a, um, I was a sophomore in high school. And, you know, I was like, well, this is a load of shit. But uh, I wasn't scared, really, at that point. He was like, you'll need a pacemaker at some point. You definitely, you don't really need it, absolutely need it now, but you'll need it, uh, you'll need the pacemaker within the next couple years. Um, And so he was trying to talk to my mom, and I was like, well, let's, let's get it within the next couple months. And he was like, that is a very brave decision, but... I think you need to think it over for a little bit, Um, talk to your parents and everyone, actually talk it out. And I was like, well, my my thinking was, I was a sophomore, too young for a job. Um, The summer would have been the last summer that I would have had uh, just free, not doing anything every day. And I was like, if I need to have surgery now, this summer would be the time to do it. And, you know, it was, it just made complete sense to me. I wasn't that scared. Um, But uh, we went home. He told told us to think it over. And the plan was, like, the next year we would get it. And I remember that whole, like, the next week or something. Now that I knew that I wasn't an idiot or I was just completely lazy or all the stuff that everybody had been telling me. I knew that there was an actual problem with my heart and I was always tired. I didn't fight it anymore. I let it take its course. I actually like showed how awful I feel that felt. Um, because whenever I'd done that in the past, you know, everybody would have just said I was lazy or some something. But I did that and I remember I mowed my grandma's yard um, one day. And just the front yard. Small, easy, easy yard to mow, and it completely winded me. I skipped dinner. I slept so much. Just napped and napped. And then my mom was like, all right, well, we need to do this then. And we got my surgery scheduled. And uh, at this point, there was like a couple months left in the school year. 
and the surgery was supposed to be take place like the week before finals or no it was finals week it was finals week um and i, I uh, got my surgery going luckily i had pretty good get grades uh so i was able my, my uh i remember my mom my mom had talked to my principal and i was able to get I, would, I was able to not take any of my finals, and I was happy. Nobody likes some finals. But, um, so I, uh, the week leading up to the surgery was scary. I've never been in surgery before. Um, I wasn't scared that I was going to die. My biggest fear was, what if I wake up during the surgery? You know, I know we're, we're like, so good with medicine and technology and everything that you know those weird cases of people waking up are like few in between and they're rare but my biggest thing was what if I can feel the excruciating pain of them cutting into me whether it be me awake or me just you know like they think that I'm asleep but I can feel all the pain but I can't move my body like paralysis that was like the biggest scare like what if I can feel this pain or what if I, you know, feel the pain, the excruciating pain during the surgery, but then when I wake up, I don't remember it, you know, I was just terrified. I was so scared. Um, but the, sur uh, the day of the surgery came and, you know, it was, it was scary and that kind of that day kind of went by in a blur because I was drugged half the day, but <laughs> the best day ever. They took me to this room, big ass white room with a big ass machine. Didn't know what it did, but I didn't care. She, uh, one of the nurses, told me she was going to put laughing gas on me, and I was like, "Ooh, laughing gas! I love this." I was like, "Mmm." So she put it on me, and I was taking my normal breaths. And when she turned away, I was like. <laughs> And I felt great. She was like, uh, I started laughing, giggling, and I was like, I bet this is your favorite part of your job. And she was like, it's it's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. And um, I uh, I was happy, you know. And she was like, we're going to put the IV in you. And she put the IV in me, and I was like, oh, I didn't even feel a thing. Let's do this. And she was like, all right, now we're going to put this... Uh, this liquid in you, it's gonna make you fall asleep. And you'll be falling asleep, and the next thing you know, you'll wake up. And I was like, okay, cool. And I was th remember thinking to myself, I was like, yeah, I've heard of these people. Nobody can get past, like, counting backwards from, like, ten. Like, nobody gets past a five. She put it in, and I was like, all right, ten. And I was gone. I woke up completely confused. My, uh, my, uh, chest was hurting. Um, everything was coming to, it was like, weird like kind of like those video game scenes where somebody blacks out or something um and uh i was like looking around um pain my mom's best friend was to my side and she was like she was like hey and i was like hi and she's like how are you feeling and i was like am i out and she was like yeah i was like Okay, and uh, she was like, I'm gonna go get your mom. And I was like, all right, cool. And she'd gone, and um, I remember she walked away, and uh, I had like a hallucination, uh, one of the worst hallucinations of my life, because I saw uh, my family, most of my family, like walking through the corridor, little hallway, and... Um, my grandpa was there, but he's the one that had died previously, and I just couldn't keep it back. I was crying like nonstop, like I want him. I wanted him there. Uh, you know, that could have been his way of saying I'm here for you. You know, who knows? But that was like the toughest part. And, um, I remember the next day, I felt like I was brand new me. Uh, I remember. My mom had, I think it was the day after, or two days after, I was on three hours of sleep. The first night I'd been able to get home and sleep in my bed, and I slept three hours. But it was the best three hours of my life. 
I woke up, I felt refreshed. Never felt refreshed after a sleep before. Like, it felt like what normal people feel like. Um, and it was nice. Three hours, I woke up at like 7 a.m. I felt great. Then uh, that whole next day, like my friend was with me for a while. and um, My mom's friend had a birthday party. I went to the birthday party, still had a cast going just to help heal my thing, my, my skin. And uh, it felt it was great. It was weird. I've never thought the days after a surgery would be great. Now I still had a lot of pain. I couldn't bring, or for the first few days, I couldn't lift my arm up at all. Um, and the doctor had told me just over the course of the week, like try to lift my arm up to a point where I started feeling pain and stop. And then just like uh, stretch. Um, and within a week, I could lift my arm up again. It was nice. Um, got to go into class for like one of the last days of school. I got to go in and say hi to my old friends and stuff. Um, and that was when everything kind of started, like when the reality of the situation kind of hit. You know, I'd already always dealt with um, depression for a while. Like I always, I like, I told myself I wasn't depressed. I was being a little bitch or whatnot. But I was all, I always felt depressed. And then once the summer came about and I had all that free time just to dwell inside my head. And on one hand, I felt better than ever physically. On the other hand, I was like, old people need this. Like. Basically, I without this thing, I'd be dead in a few years, but, you know. Um, and so, that kind of hurts. But the biggest thing that hurt me the most was I really wanted to join the military. I thought it was a very honorable thing. I wanted to do it. My grandpa was a Vietnam vet. I had two, I had two grandpas that were Vietnam vets, vets and then great-grandpas that were like World War II vets and whatnot. And... Um, I just wanted to join the military or the Coast Guard, but the pacemaker took that away, and I hated that because that was like my biggest, that was my big plan for the future, and I was depressed about that for a while, and that's when I started really watching um, YouTube, specifically Markiplier and PewDiePie um, and Tabuscus. Those three YouTubers, Tabuscus was already a big YouTuber at the time, and he had really funny trailers of video games and stuff. Markiplier was at his 200,000 um, subscriber mark whenever I started watching his videos and I watched that video and I was like, hey, this is cool, this guy's kind of growing. Um, PewDiePie was around his million subscriber mark, I think. Somewhere, something like that. Maybe 800,000. Um, and I was... It was cool because um, I was able to watch them. They, th their videos, especially their horror game videos, um, cheered me up a lot every night. Like I looked forward to going to sleep every night and watch on my phone just those, their videos of the day. And um, they re that really helped me through a lot. It didn't, it, yeah, it helped a lot watching their videos and um, and that's what started getting me into YouTube. Um, over the course of the next like year or two, I remember I'd gotten a couple, or there were a few more YouTubers that I started idolizing. Uh, not really idolizing, but like looking up to. And I was like, I got a PS4 for graduation. Um, or I spent, I got a whole bunch of money for my graduation and I got a PS4. And I realized I could make YouTube videos. And the thing I wanted to do most was make videos that helped people in times of need to cheer them up and everything. Um, like Markiplier, PewDiePie, uh, H2O Delirious, um, Andrew JRT, Tabascus had all done for me. And Christina, Christina Grimmie as well. I loved her voice. Um, so. That's why I started making YouTube videos, the ultimate term. I, I wanted to be 
like I wanted to get to be I wanted to be a high big youtuber so that I could reach all these kids that if they needed a cheer up or needed a laugh for the day something to remind them that this world is shit but there are people out there that's trying to make it less shit and that's why I started YouTubing um, the effects of the pacemaker though were pretty great I'll say that um, I was able to I was swimming at the time before and after uh, my pacemaker before my pacemaker I had I'd gotten better at swimming, but I hit a plateau, and it felt like a plateau that I couldn't get over. And my pacemaker came about that next year, smashed my top, top, uh, my my fastest speeds in all of my events. Like I took the twenty, uh, the fifty free. Um, twenty eight seconds was my fastest time. Within a year, I smashed it to twenty five. Felt great. Um, so swimming somehow I had all this great energy now it also uh, was in fact um, or it also helped that we moved to a harder swim coach where it was an actual swim team not like a, um, it was a hard swim team but that combined with the new energy that I had and um, Swimming was the only thing that kept me at that kept me going for like the new school. Like I liked it a lot. I loved swimming. It felt great. Um, and whenever I'd gone to the new school, I didn't have any friends, so swimming was my thing. And the fact that I was getting better really made me happy. Um, so that kept me going for a while, and then I started getting friends again, and uh, just a couple here and there. And then graduation came about or senior year came about. And then I'd been in Boy Scouts for a long time, but didn't really, I didn't really care to finish. I was tired of it. But whenever the pacemaker came about, I kind of, I kind of hit, started hitting it harder again. And um, I uh, got my Eagle Scout within, um, with like a, within a week of my 18th birthday, which meant that if I didn't get it by my 18th birthday, I couldn't get my Eagle Scout, but I managed to pull it off, and uh, because I got the pacemaker, I think it actually really gave me a lot of motivation to do that. Um, it gave me more of an ability to do it, I would say, and then um, I graduated, and uh, man, it was great. Graduation right after getting my Eagle Scouts, and then I moved into college. And you know, after a few years of college, I'm here making this video. Um, yeah. So that is basically the story about my pacemaker. Um, it was a tough time. My stomach is growling on like another. Um, but. Yeah, my, my pacemaker is kind of a part of me now. Um, my family call me, or a lot of my family call me um, Spider-Man. Or not Spider-Man, uh, Iron Man. Like Tony Stark, he's got a little arc reactor going. Without this thing, uh, I wouldn't be alive. Um, so, you know, it's it took away some dreams, but it, my pacemaker ultimately led to a lot of other dreams and uh, happiness that I didn't get to experience before. Um, you know, I hated myself for a few years, but, like, I, I still hate my body, like, how unhealthy I am. It uh, seems like everything that can go wrong goes wrong, but, um, for the most part, this pacemaker has been a blessing. And, um, the biggest, the biggest thing that my pacemaker gave to me was my, the last, or my senior year, um, States swimming states 5A. I was on the 400 free relay team, and we actually got first place. And I'd never gotten the first place medal before. And the pacemaker was the thing for that. So that's my story of my pacemaker. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, it's been a blessing, it's, it's broken dreams, it's created dreams, but ultimately it's helped me out a lot. Um, thanks everybody for watching.
I'll see y'all next time.